This episode of Trifles is brought to you by the Baker Street Journal, the leading publication of Sherlock Holmes scholarship since 1946. Find them online at bakerstreetirregulars.com. Welcome to Trifles, a weekly podcast about the Sherlock Holmes stories. It is, of course, a trifle, but there is nothing so important as trifles. Yes, the lodger was veiled, the face was yellow, and the valley was fearsome, but there are so many other details to pick apart in the stories. Pray, be precise as to details. You know the plots, but what about the minutia? Have you ever stopped to wonder what kind of medical practice Dr. Watson actually ran? Or about the number of Holmes' monographs? Or how much the rent was at 221B Baker Street? You are very inquisitive, Mr. Holmes. It is my business to know what other people don't know. Scott Monty and Bert Wolder will have the answers to these questions and more in Trifles. The game's afoot. Episode 200, The Setting of Agra. Hello and welcome to Trifles, the Sherlock Holmes podcast where we look at some of the details in the Sherlock Holmes stories. I'm Scott Monty. I'm Bert Wilder. And I am fortifying myself for this episode, Bert. I am concentrating my troops for the relief of Lucknow. Well, we will get right to the setting of Agra in just a moment. Just a reminder that this episode is available on iHost.co slash trifles200. It'll take you directly to the show notes for this episode on SherlockHolmesPodcast.com. Uh, there you can look through links. You can leave us a comment. You can make sure you subscribe to the show. Uh, and we encourage you to subscribe in any format. We do appreciate the amount of support that we've gotten. Over the course of the last months and year, uh, we will be getting ready uh, in December to send out our thank you gifts to all of our Patreon supporters. Uh, if you subscribe at or support us at different levels, uh, we give you different gifts. So check those out on our website and uh, a link to the Patreon page is there or just go directly to patreon.com slash trifles. How much um, support do people need to give to get a new Tesla? A new Tesla? Uh, I believe they need to uh, take over the recording of the show for us for that. Uh, oh, okay. Yeah, we will, we will give away the show for a Tesla. Oh, okay. But you need to give us a Tesla. See, that's, that's the thing. Oh, uh, you and know, I just heard the other day that the, the next government stimulus during the pandemic is going to be every American needs to send $1,200 to the federal government. That doesn't seem right to me. <laughs> oh, a, a, a chicken in every pot, a car in every garage and $1,200 in Donald Trump's every bank account. <laughs> <laughs> oh, OK, well, we are here to talk about. Settings. You know, the last time we talked about a setting, we talked about Dartmoor and its particular ap appropriate setting for uh, the Hound of the Baskervilles and how that just made it perfect. Well, let's go on to Agra, which we, of course, come across in only one story, the sign of four. This is where the Agra treasure comes from. I mean, who would have thought? Uh, but the description we have of Agra uh, comes directly from Jonathan Small as he was recounting his tale to Holmes and Watson. He says, The city of Agra is a great place, swarming with fanatics and fierce devil worshippers of all sorts. Our handful of men were lost among the narrow, winding streets. Our leader moved across the river, therefore, and took up his position in the old fort of Agra. I don't know if any of you gentlemen have ever read or heard anything of that old fort. It's a very queer place, the queerest I've ever been in. And I've been in some rum corners, too. First of all, it's enormous in size. I should think that the enclosure must be acres and acres. There's a modern part which took all our garrison, women, children, stores, and everything else with plenty of room over. But the modern part is nothing like the size of the old quarter where nobody goes and which is given over to the scorpions and the centipedes. 
It is all full of great deserted halls and winding passages and long corridors twisting in and out so that it's easy enough for folk to get lost in. For this reason, it was seldom that anyone went into it, though now and again a party with torches might go exploring. That's a fascinating and almost gothic description of the old Fort of Agra. It is. It's wonderful. I love those details. And it's, a, it's again, another hallmark of the work of Conan Doyle. He's, he pays so much attention to, and it's because of his own reading. He was deeply affected by writers like Captain Maine Reed, who began every chapter by putting the reader squarely in a particular environment. So you find this coming up again and again in the stories of Sherlock Holmes. So it's a lovely collection of details, and it indicates um, considerable research, and it's beautifully put in the mouth of Jonathan Small. Mm. The, the, um, the fort of Agra is a fine Mughal fort, and I wasn't aware that it was, you know, it shows you my own geographic ignorance, that the Taj Mahal was also in you know, this part of India. And just looking online, um, you know, again, you've got many echoes of the description that Jonathan Small gave us. The Agra is one of the finest Mughal forts in India, walking through courtyard after courtyard of this palatial red sandstone and marble fortress. Your amazement grows at the scale of what was built here. Construction began in 1565. Uh, additions were made using white marble. It was built primarily as a military structure, but transformed into a palace. And uh, lovely descriptions you can, you can find in a variety of sources. It contains a maze of buildings, as Jonathan Small told us, forming a city within a city, including vast underground sections. Although many of the structures were destroyed over the years by different people, and finally the British, who used the fort as a garrison. And today, much of the fort is used by the military and is off limits to the general public. Hmm. How fascinating. Well, you know, it, I, I never, I have to say, when I think of the Taj Mahal in India, I, I, I never really placed it in any particular city. I just knew, well, Taj Mahal, it's just a famous, <laughs> a famous residence, a famous mausoleum, I should say. Um, a famous destination, but it's only two and a half kilometers away from the, the Fort of Agra. Mm. Uh, how, how close it was to the heart of this um, very important setting in the canon. And, and yet, uh, as much as Conan Doyle was a romantic at heart, and, and the Taj Mahal was a, the ultimate in romantic gestures, uh, as it was built for, uh, as, a, as a mausoleum of lost love, um, it's surprising that the Taj Mahal itself never uh, warranted a mention in the canon. Oh, that's very good. Yeah, you know, it is interesting. In the times that Holmes travels outside of the United Kingdom, um, you know, we don't get much of that sort of local detail, ex except, of course, in his his uh, peregrinations in Switzerland and fleeing. Uh, side of the Reichenbach and so on, but uh, yeah. you know, even when they go to, even when they, we know they're in France. We really have very little local color. That's interesting. Yeah, I hadn't thought about that. Yeah. Well, a little bit more of uh, some details about the Fort of Agra and the city of Agra right after this quick word. You know, we say the Baker Street Journal is an irregular quarterly of Sherlockiana. But the fact is, you can count on the Baker Street Journal to arrive in your mailbox, if you're a regular subscriber, five times a year. That's once a quarter, plus the Christmas annual. And each time it arrives, it has a regular array of features, such as the editor's gas lamp, art in the blood, the commonplace book, Baker Street inventory, and more. And of course, peppered throughout, are insightful articles and scholarship that make the world of Sherlock Holmes come alive to people around the world as they try their hand at finding out deeper details about some of the 
minutiae in the stories, or about Victorian life. If you don't yet, please consider a subscription to the Baker Street Journal. Go to bakerstreetirregulars.com and make sure you get your regular delivery of the journal today. We're back talking about the setting of Agra. You know, as I look through the Encyclopedia Sherlockiana, Bert, which was really my first reference to the Sherlock Holmes canon. I, I had uh, the complete Sherlock Holmes as a single volume, and then I had uh, the 1977 uh, classic by Jack Tracy, the Encyclopedia Sherlockiana, which was designed as um, a- as a reference guide of sorts. You know, Jack Tracy put this together um, as if you were reading the Sherlock Holmes stories uh, when they were written. And you could look up in an encyclopedia what some of these locations, words, terms, etc. might be. So you get to Agra, and it says it's a city of north-central India. Population, I get this, population 188,300. Just for (laughs) reference, uh, the city of Agra today is about 1.85 million people. Uh, it is the third largest city in uh, that region, and it is, I believe, the 24th largest city in India. Uh, so a little bigger than uh, than it used to be back then. But Tracy also says it's located upon the Ganges. Uh, the city is one of the oldest in India and has several interesting structures, the best known being the celebrated Taj Mahal. During the mutiny, its 16th century fort was a place of refuge for the Europeans. So what do we know about the 16th century <laughs> and Agra? Well, fascinating. Yeah, well, the 16th century, you know, in the 1500s, um, well, I mean, there's a couple of things going on here. One is that, you know, you and I are evidencing our own sort of West, Western ignorance <laughs> of 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 the rest of the world, and and not only of the geography, but also of the history. Um, and that that continues if you look online at some of the other information resources, a sort of echo Jack Tracy's entry back in the 1970s. Mm. If you look at Wikipedia, for example, it says, well, you know, the Battle of Agra was a comparatively minor, but nevertheless decisive action during the Indian Rebellion of 1857, known as the First War of Indian Independence. And it's interesting, you know, how the Western view of this is, well, this is the Indian mutiny. And the uh, the more likely local view of this is, this is the first war for independence, during which Rebels attacked a column of British troops which had relieved a garrison at Agra. But although they surprised the column, they were defeated and dispersed. And this allowed the British to establish communications across all of northern India and to concentrate troops for the vital relief of Lucknow. So that, you know, just sort of reduces Agra to a footnote. Mm -hmm. Um, But before the rebellion broke out, uh, Agra was an important center of British administration And commerce and station nearby were the 3rd Bengal Fusiliers and a battery of uh, artillery and the 44th and the 67th regiments of the Bengal Native Infantry and so on. Um, But, I mean, to your point, Agra Fort, you know, was the main residence of the emperors of the Mughal dynasty until um, 1638. And before that, we uh, know that. Yeah, the, it, the, the uh, Mughal dynasty relocated the capital from, uh, from Delhi to Agra uh, in, uh, as, as the fort was, was built. Um, it was completed uh, in 1573 under the reign of uh, Akbar, who was one of the greatest Mughal emperors. Um, and it took 4,000 workers eight years to complete the building of the fort. Um, and, and that's, that's where it remained uh, as the uh, imperial residence until 1638. Now, 
it's it's been owned by many emperors and rulers uh, since that time, and uh, the the fort has undergone changes to its appearance. But one of the things that strikes me as most interesting about it is uh, it has many secret uh, subterranean apartments and edifices, and it's said that the entire fort is interconnected through tunnels and underground pathways. Uh, the, the emperors who own uh, the fort during their respective reigns uh, are, are said to have contributed to uh, the expansion of the uh, underground pathways and, and tunnels for obvious reasons. Mm. Well, looking at the history of it is interesting. Today, uh, the, the sole entry point to the fort these days is the Amar Singh Gate to the south where you buy an entrance ticket. Its dog-leg design was meant to confuse attackers who made it past the first line of defense, which was a crocodile-infested moat. Hmm. And further along, further along the eastern edge of the fort, say now, and Jonathan Small would know something about crocodiles and moats. Further along the eastern edge of the fort, you find the Kas Mahal, a beautiful marble pavilion and pool that formed the living quarters of Shah Jahan. There's a large courtyard, and just to the north of the Kas Mahal is the, I'm sorry, I'm pronouncing all of this wrong, Mathaman Burj, the wonderful white marble octagonal tower and palace mm. where Shah Jahan was imprisoned for eight years. But there's also a... Uh, Oh, right. And there's a garden that's been brought back to life in recent years. And in the courtyard is an innocuous looking entrance that leads down a flight of stairs into a two story labyrinth of underground rooms and passageways where Akbar used to keep his 500 strong harem, it says. <laughs> Absolutely Fantastic. unbelievable. Well, there are uh, a, a number of uh, architectural uh, elements of uh, the fort. I mean, you just mentioned a few of them. The, the, the Shah Jahani Mahal that you mentioned there is probably one of the earliest attempts of Emperor Shah Jahan to turn the red sandstone palace into white marble, which I suppose would have made it kind of the, that, that would have made the connection between it and the Taj Mahal. Um, but there are other uh, important structures. There's a, uh, Jahangir's house. It's a monolithic tank, and it was built by Jahangir. Uh, the tank was initially used for bathing, and it's now part of Akbar's Bengali Mahal. Uh, what else is there? There's uh, the Nagina Masjid. That's uh, a mosque which was built by Shah Jahan. It was built using white marble only and was considered a private place of worship. There's the Ghaznin Gate, which actually belongs to the tomb of Mahmud Ghazni, one of the rulers of the Ghaznavid Empire. The gate was moved inside the fort by the British for political reasons. An interesting uh, step there to um, you know, retain the, um, I don't know if you want to call it sanctity or uh, at least existence of uh, this, this um, uh, this gate, so it didn't get destroyed in the mutiny. Uh, and then um, Akbar's Mahal. The ruins of Akbar's famous palace still remain in the fort. And uh, this is where Akbar uh, met his death. And the entire palace was built using red sandstone. I mean, just so many fascinating uh, and legendary elements here. I mean, in, in terms of using it as a setting, you know, I'm, not only was, you know, the the legend, you, know, you could imagine ghosts roaming the halls there in, in uh, Conan Doyle's storytelling uh, style, um, but also the sheer scale of it. You know, you consider the, the scale of, of, uh, of Dartmoor. And how vast and expansive it was, and this is pretty much the uh, the architectural uh, version uh, or expression of Dartmoor 
in India, if you will. A great comparison. Like Dartmoor, Agra is a location of fear and fascination, you know, which, which is one of these things that I think is also a hallmark of things that are outside of England, outside of the Western sphere of Holmes and Watson, and that have such fascination and bring such danger and trouble for people like Captain Morstan and Major Sholto, Jonathan Small. And it's interesting, you know, it's a setting where there is so much, even, but even there, you know, in the pursuit of the great Agra treasure, there's so much betrayal uh, by these two Englishmen, Sholto and Morstan, who initially agree to help Small and the Sikhs escape, but in the end decide to dig it all up and keep it all for themselves. And that is anything but a trifle. It is, of course, a trifle, but there is nothing so important as trifles. Please join us again next week for another installment of Trifles. Show notes are available on SherlockHolmesPodcast.com. Please subscribe to us on Apple Podcasts and be sure to check out our longer show, I Hear of Sherlock Everywhere, where we interview notable Sherlockians and share news of the Sherlockian world. You've taken my breath away, Mr. Holmes. The old Fort of Agra is a queer place. Huge. It's full of passages and rooms. More entrances than you can count. There were many gates, and uh, because I was an ex-soldier and British, they put me in charge of one of them and gave me a couple of Sikhs who'd stayed loyal to us. It was a lonely place. <laughs>